yo, at a Worlds, Tom would just be messing around with the stick, and then all of a sudden I'm watching highlights. He's doing the same thing in the game, you know? You watch highlights, and I'm like, yo. I'm you glad we're not going to see your impression. I was impersonating Tom. No. <laughs> Always a goalie because you play offense and indoor goalie, outdoor all star game in 2019. You played attack, put one in the net. Yeah. Two. Was it two in the net? <laughs> <laughs> nah. Um, I was lucky that, um, you know, as this game's growing, you're just going to see more dads introducing their sons and daughters because they played. While well, I was lucky that during a time, a lot of my friends that played their dad's never played but mine did um so i grew up with a stick in the hand from the time i was born um i got into organized lacrosse when i was four years old i was a four-year-old playing with first and second graders and my dad coached me from my first day until my last day of senior year when i was in fourth grade i broke our goalie's hand in practice and without even hesitating he's like you you did it you got to get in that it reminds me of christmas story i was padded up from head to toe and he was shooting on me I'm like, I'm not wearing these pads. And he's like, well, if you get hit and you cry, like you're putting the pads back on. And it was our first tournament and Greg Cahol and played for Ron DeCoy. He went to UVA, played a little bit of pro, rung one somewhere I didn't want to get hit. And everyone went running over the sideline. And my dad's like, what's going on? And the ref was like, your goalie called a timeout. And I called a timeout to run off the field. And I was crying in the woods because I didn't want to cry on the field. And he bought me my first goalie stick. And from there, it was like... Damn. I had owned a goalie stick. I owned a player stick. Uh, all I loved was lacrosse, so they were both in my hands constantly, and I just followed that path to lead me to where I am today. Me personally, my first time playing lacrosse, I was in sixth grade. Um, I was really bad. I just started playing because I played football at the time, and uh, all my friends that I played football with played lacrosse in the spring. They were like, yo, you should play lacrosse. And I was like, all right. I went out for the team, I had no idea what I was doing. I might have had my uh, jersey underneath my shoulder pads or something like that. You know, <laughs> like, yeah, it just completely just <laughs> off. Uh, but I still loved it, you know, like, even though I was bad and I just loved, like, the creativity and everything behind it. Why face off? Was it was automatically face off or no? No, no, no. When did you, you get, like, real good at facing off? I started facing off in maybe like my freshman year, but yeah, I tried it out because we just needed a backup face-off guy. Like we had a great, we had a good face-off guy for my high school team, but he kept getting hurt. So our coach was like, we need a backup. Yeah. So I was like, all right, like I'll be the guy if he can't go, you know? And like, I just kept working on it. Then he graduated. So then they were like, you need a good face-off guy. So I just was like, yeah, somebody's gotta take him. I gotta get good at him for the team. And then uh, I just got really good at him. <laughs> I just got really good at him. <laughs> I had a nag for him. Yeah, I had a nag for him. Yeah. The number one reason why kids quit playing a specific sport is they're not having fun. Number two is they can't pick up the skill. It's too hard. And so that's why golf, lacrosse, hockey turnover. And so I, I, was, I was that guy unless my mom was there driving me and forced me to go to practice, I was ready to quit. Cause I was like, fuck this, it's just too hard and I'm better at other shit. Did any of you guys like really deal with the struggle early on and? Yeah, we had a, a scoopers clinic in pre-K after school and it was tennis balls and the little like plastic complete STX sticks. And it was just so, it was just scoop the ball. Like all of us like bobbleheads and I was like just in tears. I was like, this sucks, like this is so hard to do. And um Lenny Castellino was a Long Island guy was like just get down and like pick it up I was like I can't like I hate this and then I played baseball for like two more years and I was like it was just so difficult it was hard to like understand to not rake the ball um I don't even want this on camera but I was just pretty good when I was little I don't know you were good right away I mean not like good I, I, I like I am there. now 
Yeah. But Who's like, that? I just, I, yeah, I, I don't exactly. know. I scooped that ball. Too. Yeah, I did it. I, I, I just scooped it. I just raised it up. Yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, I was little and not like good in the games, but I, the skills were, I played hockey. So maybe that was part of it. Like those skills translate, but yeah, it came naturally to me. They call those in sports like a, like a Lindsey Vaughn or a Tiger Woods, someone who just picks it up. They call them prodigies, not to put that pressure on you. <laughs> but like when, when there's a technical thing that you just have a knack for, like Mozart and a piano, like whatever, like that doesn't, that is, that's cool and unique. That's probably why you play the way you do. Yeah, I don't know. The skills are just. Do you not give a fuck when you're out there and you miss? Are you just like, cool, I'm going to keep doing that? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I envy that. I think I'm an irrationally confident person. So like if I miss it, I think the next one's going in. That's just like a mindset. I think everyone should feel that way though. I mean like certainly at this table, but like in the whole league, everyone's pretty good. They should have confidence that the next one's going in. Has there ever been a time where you, where you doubted? Um, yeah, for sure. When I was in college, I dealt with a lot of self-doubt. Um, I think you'd, you'd work your way through that. I'm always curious in um, in how players that become world class take on practice, and because uh, it's all different, and we're we're in sports trying to serve a service a blueprint. I'd be like you got to practice X amount of hours or Y amount of reps, and then I found some of the most skilled guys in the world and the most successful have a casual approach to practice, and then you find the others that are like. You know, what, what's worked for you all? I think one of the things that's always helped me, and I'm sure it's the same for everybody at this table, like I always loved the game. So like doing extra work at like a young age or even in high school, like it was never really like that much mature. Right. You know, like I was kind of like drawn to it. Like after school, be like, go home, grab my stick, go out and play. So like naturally I was like putting in more time just because I loved it. And then I think when I got older, uh, it became a little bit more of like that deliberate pa practice where like I was going out of my own shooting. You know, when I was in college, especially, my big thing was wall ball. Like I would try and do, I pretty much finish almost every night with like 200 touches, you know, just to give me that confidence. Like I have my stick in my hand all the time. But I think as I got older, it was a little bit more deliberate practice. A big turning point working out with you your last season like the way you went about it i just feel like before that was very much like put a bucket of balls on this side shoot put a bucket of balls on this side shoot take a couple each way and that's it and you were like four down the alley four sweeps four hitch and sweep four alley circuit and it was like a workout <laughs> and, <it was> like, <laughs> and i was just like dude i'm exhausted yeah. And I was like dead, and you were like what thirty six, and you're like, all right, that's like the first third. Yeah, so that's like, the first what? third. Water break, get back. Yeah. Four here, four yeah. there. And I was like, <laughs> I had never practiced like that. And I was like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just do it like that every time. And I'm like, I'm like, how does your back keep up with it? My back's killing me. You're like, oh, I slipped like two discs. And I was like, okay, it's like that's how I feel. <laughs> I was like, how do you do this for so long? But I had never gone about it like that. Like I, same as you. Like I, I never had someone need to tell me to go out and shoot or practice I, like did it every time college high school and I just never did it like to that level or in that that kind of intensity like I enjoyed it and that kind of felt like work but it felt like work that needed to be done yeah I hired a shooting coach it was, it was actually uh I worked with Jameson Kester and then I worked with Bobby Benson it was always like for me it was a quest of uh just committing as if I was in the NFL you know, and I remember, I mean, you know, most of us here, you know, we dedicate our lives to the craft and the intellectual component of it. And I remember when I was living in Baltimore with Danny Gladding, who was playing for the Bayhawks, and my buddy from college, Nick Donahue, and they would go off to work. And I was just like, it was clicked where I was like, damn, if I'm gonna actually explore being a pro lacrosse player and while we don't have practice every day I'm just going to fucking get out and shoot every day and it sort of started there and then I hired a shooting coach and then it was like back in I was like back in school and so I was just all regimented but it's not for everyone yeah uh, I'm I'm the opposite um mine's my approach has definitely changed uh over the years I was like Mikey just the love of the game gravitated stick into my hand and just not 
not even considering a practice. I was just living, you know, like I was just living my life and it would happen to have a lacrosse stick in my hand. My approach now, you know, it's unique in the fact that I do play two different positions, but um, I found that that I've put so much time into lacrosse and uh, I'm 29 years old now, um, going on my eighth year. The responsibilities of my life outside of the 48 minutes of play just keep adding up. And um, I feel like in order to be the best version of myself at this point in my career, because I've put in and taken the reps and because I've had success and because I know who I am, um, it's more about taking care of that side of my life that allows me to just be the kid that just picks up the stick and plays and doesn't have to worry about it. You know, I can say that I'm lucky in the fact that, you know, I can screw on my head and show up to the game and and play. So you're not getting shots during the week? No, I Fucking hell. I was laughing. I was I was walking Yo, he's around. Tra- I was, wa- I was <laughs> he's, walking it's around. So frustrating. I was, wa- <laughs> it's, it's so, so I was frustrating. walking around training camp <laughs> and I got a great connection with all the goalies, guys I respect, I know what it takes. Um, and they're like, yes, look at this, they got all these bruises, you know, and they're limping around and I'm like, I've only seen like five shots. You know? like, <laughs> I, feel, I feel so fresh, like, but I just love being around the guys, you know, and, and being there and yeah, it's just, like riding a bike at this point. You put so many hours and you feel like you've mastered it. You've done it all. I've got scored on. I've scored. I've saved. You know, it's... So how do you sit in the net? Like, what is your style? Just playing free. Um, something I learned from Lyle. Like, you just play free and all the stuff that I talked about, like, just like you were getting your shooting regiment, like my regiment of taking care of what I have to take care of so I can just play lacrosse just part of being able to play this game free. And I think that's one of the beauties of, you talk about the creativity and the history of it. Like part of that history is you play the game free-minded and and you let your stick and and your play do the talking. How much do you you ever struggle with that or you you stay present when you play? Oh no, it's a constant battle. I think it's a constant battle between what you're talking about, Romar with Paul's kind of regiment and then kind of just having that free flowing you know, kind of approach to the game. Um, you know, and you mentioned it before, prior to like ever playing organized, I just kind of played around in the backyard and with my buddies. And you've heard the Thompsons talk about that sort of style of, you know, training. Sometimes it's like you almost look at training and just like playing the game. And the way I kind of came up, you know, my, my dad used to run these training groups and kind of like what Michael was talking about, I would always play up um, and he'd have, I think it was like four hours on Sunday mornings and there'd be a different age group on the hour. And I had the pleasure of doing all four. <laughs> and uh, I was the younger kids to start. And, you know, it was like my age group to start. And, you know, they would get older and, and bigger and stronger as time went on. And um, yeah, there were times I absolutely hated it, but I knew that that was what was best for me. And I knew that it made a huge difference in my development. And then I think the other side of me is I think I think me just playing around with my friends in the backyard, like even in high school, even like messing around at the end of practice to this day, I think I'm making strides forward. Yo, at uh, Worlds, Tom would just be messing around with the stick and then all of a sudden I'm watching highlights. He's doing the same thing in the game, you know? You watch highlights. I'm, like, you know, like, I'm you glad we're not see your impression. <laughs> I always do it. I always do it first thing, Tom. <laughs> he does. <laughs> you're, you're always you're always the last one out there shooting though. Yeah. yeah every yeah, team, yeah. every practice I've ever been around it, he's yeah. the last one. Yeah, yeah. Always he's always one. laughing the entire time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every shot he takes, he starts laughing after <laughs> he shoots it. No lie. Good or bad, you yeah. know. Just uh, laughs after it picks up another ball. Yeah. Shoots. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Plays yeah. a pig with Jeff every practice. Yeah, yeah. Right. disguised as as a mess around, but I like he's getting dialed. Like yeah. he's in there, he's absolutely, taking shots absolutely, every single time. Yeah, yeah. No, I think uh, I think for me, like uh, you know, definitely the enjoyment of the game. You know, like having fun. I think that I would probably say I take personally is like the fact that being a face off guy, you're not looked at as a player and. A lot of people's eyes you know you don't look at you're not looked at as um somebody who's skillful or somebody who's worked really hard 
to develop different areas of their game. So that's something that I'm always constantly trying to do, you know, whether that's like after practice, you know, like I'm always trying to shoot more or I'm always trying to put myself in that situ in a situation for people to be like, okay, he's playing lacrosse. And what sucks about that is in this position is binary, right? So it's like, it's either win or loss, right? I go out for a face off, it's either you win or you lose, you know, and then you run off the field yeah. and then you have to sit and either feel great about that or either feel terrible about that. And then you feel like you're just proving everybody right, yeah. you know? So, um, would you say the, the new shot clock is, is complicating it now because you're winning more than you have and now it's about is your team scoring after you win? Um, I think it's put a lot of pressure on me to uh, to be even to be even better at other parts of the field, um, which I like the challenge. What are you guys think about the new clock, thirty-two? I mean, my opinion is just entirely what Trevor's is as his teammate. Like, if he's like, I love it, I'm like great if he's like i hate it i'm like this rule sucks <laughs> like, you know, like whatever he thinks is the best face i've got on the planet and as a teammate i'm like you know i'm on your side <laughs> yeah what do you think about letting the game come to you how do you think about that in in nature and how you your presence is out there and the question might be specifically, like, you could go to the net every shift. Why don't you? More specifically. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Like, people just want to know, <laughs> right? And if I didn't say that, why not? <laughs> you know what I mean? I think for me, it's changed over time. Like, when I was younger, my dad used to always preach, like, let the game come to you. Let the game come to you. And it usually did. And I think it's because, like, everybody here, like, at a younger age, I was playing at like a higher skill level than my peers. So like I can kind of imp impose myself when I wanted to in the flow of the game. Now, because you're playing against guys that are so good, I almost feel like if I don't insert myself early, like I almost feel a little bit removed from it. And I'm somebody that like, I gotta get into a flow, you know? And so I think it's changed for me from letting the game come to me to inserting myself. And that's why I usually try and get into it early. Like off the end line, like take a run, you know? Cause even if I miss, even if I get stripped, it's like, all right, like I'm here, you know? So I think it's definitely changed for me over time, but now it's, I, I gotta insert myself into it. Yeah. I like that, like, um, like that first shift. It's kind of like, I feel the same way. It's kind of like ripping the bandaid off, you know? It's like, whatever happens, it's like, I get, I got, I'm stepping, I'm stepping in right now. You know, I'm stepping out. I'm stepping out. I think Let's the go. mentality behind that too, though, is especially for a guy like you, you're getting the number one defenseman on every team. If you can take the ball, show that you can beat the team's number one defenseman and make something happen, like to me, that's just injecting confidence in your offense. Absolutely. One other thing that I would add to, I think like to that point, I think one of the challenges in the league is like your teammates are so good. You know what I mean? So like, I might have the number one defenseman, but we got Jack Hanna on a shorty or Connor Kelly on a shorty. You know, like we got a lot of great matchups across the board. So I think it's that finding that balance of like, let me make sure that I'm getting into the game, but like what's our best option on the table? And how do you guys sort that out? I think that I think that's the tricky part. And it's I just think flow. I think it's flow and I think we've had success because we've been good about finding that balance you know I think and I think we all do a good job of picking our spots you know like me and Karen we take big big littles off the end line we like to initiate out of the box with those guys off the shorties that kind of kick starts our offense now we're dodging rushed approaches kicking it to the backside three-step dodge so I think we're, because we've been playing together for a little bit we're starting to find that rhythm but I think that's a challenge of it too I mean the game is so much more nuanced than the spectators or the analysts give it credit for you know what i mean like i I've, I've always felt that attack if someone's gonna let the game come to you it's attackman because you're on the field the whole time in transition balls getting circled through you i always felt like i subscribed to that as a midfielder then there was a moment where i was like oh no 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 i, I gotta go get the game because we're not on the field as much and so if you're coming through 
and you have two other guys who are good Dodgers, it's up to you. You can you can look at the fourth quarter halfway through and not have taken a dodge. You know what I mean? So you got to like insert yourself. I like that. You know, the, the, I, I, I fucking hate it when I'm hearing a play caller be like, haven't heard much from Tom Shriver yet. Top of the second quarter. I'm like, are you watching the game? Is that just because he hasn't scored yet? But like the dude has generated all of the offense. And so, you know, lacrosse is actually closer to soccer and hockey and its score sheets than basketball, where I think announcers can say that if like someone hasn't gotten on the board yet in hoops, but it's not all goals and assists. And I think that's one of the things we're seeing in the PLL now is trying to find, you know, the hot hand, getting, you know, every team has six studs offensively. Shorter clock, less time. You want to balance, like, getting back on defense and not giving up transition, but also setting guys up with those, like, dodge up top through X, get it to the backside, and then all of a sudden there's seven seconds left. Like, I think that's one of the challenges that some teams are facing, and I think it's something that we'll see get figured out more and more but I think those kind of invisible plays become that much more important yeah I I really like looking at those things like my role at Notre Dame I run the box so like I mean I'm a competitor so I'm like how can I how can I impact this game I'm obviously a coach so I'm not on the field doing anything but it's like okay I got that guy off the field in two less seconds than I previously could have or did last time like now the guy's running onto the offensive side of the uh, field, and he, you know, he g- gained two steps on the guy that he was subbing with. Like that's a great play by me. <laughs> Not, you know, a little... <laughs> but that's that's like the way that I think about it and like break it down. You know, like, yeah, the little wind. <laughs> yeah, like we dominate the box at Notre Dame. That's at least that's my mindset. It's like. <laughs> How would you say, you know, I think about posterity a lot, but the future of the game, um, how to build a a format for the young kids right now that look up to you that you know, can take on those next steps and be the next great versions of you. There's coaching, there's IQ, there's fun, there's presence, there's work ethic, there's, there's regimens. Like what is, if there's one thing that, you would like to see either better or leave behind or something that you're currently doing to just leave the game in a better place? What would that be? Uh, Mine would be the appreciation for professional lacrosse. Um, I I feel extremely grateful for the position I'm in and I feel like um, people don't recognize what we're doing as professional lacrosse players. Professional athletes are often judged by the amount of money their contract's worth, uh, by how fancy their cars are, by which celebrity they're dating. But what people don't recognize is that we're the best at what we do, just like the best basketball players, the best at what he does. But we're in we're we're in the communities. We're helping grow the game. We're more accessible than any other, you know professional athlete around and the time and dedication and love that we're showing are real are real things whereas a Lamborghini on Twitter or Instagram you know that's aesthetic to the eyes and it's cool to scroll through but that's not substance of the type of person that they are and we show that every single week when you know we're signing autographs after the game and every you know you know and I'm taking that time because I care and if they can't if I'm judged off of the amount of money I make rather than the type of person I am to me that's just not the right way of going about life and in in looking at us as professional lacrosse players like the respect that we deserve doesn't just happen on the field it's what we're doing dedicating to be a stepping stone and to be to be a an outlet for these kids to have a dream and um, you know, to me, that's what I hold most special to myself. That was hard. That was, that was, that was, that was real. Yeah. When I think about this stuff, a, a, a lot of it's just appreciate appreciation and like having pride in, in what you do. Um, 
and I think lacrosse like is all of our outlets to do that. Um, and I think we're lucky to have that chance. I think, you, you know, you kind of look around and the stakes are high, like being able to like compete, you know, with teammates and, and travel and go through adversity in a public setting and like put it all out on the line, work with a team um, throughout the week, have physical demands, mental demands. I think like that just makes you a stronger, like more formidable person at the end of the day. And I'm, I'm very, very grateful to have that outlet. Um, and then I think the other thing, as I've gotten older and, you know, I'm starting a family of my own now, and it, it doesn't happen just because of you. And I've never been more aware of that. You know, I think for a large part of my life, it was my parents, my family, other coaches that I've had. Now it's like, yeah, more my wife and, and my other teammates. And, 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 you know, I just, I think a lot about those guys. I think a lot about these people kind of around me. I think a lot about these fans, you know, no one understands that more than you, like the fans of the, the lifeblood to this thing and seeing them in the stands and seeing kids with PLL jerseys out at clinics and camps and stuff. Like, it's just cool. I, I, I think we're all very lucky to, to be playing professional lacrosse right now. Um, and I think the way things are going, everybody will be able to continue to say that. Um, but I'm just, I'm really grateful to be a part of it now. Um, and to kind of still have that really tight relationship with the next generation of lacrosse kids and all that stuff. So it's just, uh, a lot of appreciation and, you know, that's kind of how I would define it on my side. I feel a great responsibility of being a, a, a good steward of the game. I don't know if I ever told you this, but like I have a I have a Paul Rabel signed jersey at home, you know, and like I I think it's well documented. Like I had a Harrison sign poster on my wall, and then I got to play with him. Like I, I just think about all the guys like like Kyle and yourself who, you know, you didn't know anything about Ryder Garnsey when you signed a Rabel jersey, right? But like that made a big impact. I thought that was really cool. So if I can have a a small impact signing something after the game or you know, whatever it is, um, I take great pride in that. I, th I think that's like one of our responsibilities because th there were so many people before me who did that and did the right way and it helped cultivate such a love for the game that I have that um, hopefully I can, you know, just, just pass that forward. I wish it was like less of a checked box to just tell people to like get here. You need to at least spend way more time on it than everyone else. And uh, we were talking about it in the car, and it's like kids are, it's almost insulting when a kid's like, Yeah, I want to play at Duke or Notre Dame. And it's like, You don't even practice. <laughs> like, so, and I wish like kids know like, how much time they need to spend to go and do these things, to be on Team USA and to play at Notre Dame and to be the best goalie in the world. It's like, like we said, none of us need to be told to work on our game. We just did it because we loved it and we're competitive. And like, bare minimum, you need to be the most competitive and you need to love the game. And then, then good things will happen. Man in the arena stuff, you know? And perhaps that's uh, that's just uh, something that will always live in the universe is people wanting a get out of jail free card, a hall pass, a blueprint, or a direct sort of VIP line into the destination. But it's always the journey and it's, and it's not for the weak and timid, you know? So, anyway, this is good, guys. I appreciate you all. That's it. So, Thank you, guys. Thanks, crew. Appreciate you guys. So much.